Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back uh, to this session. I uh, hope you all had a good break over lunch. Uh, this is going to be a, an interesting romp through uh, the implications of a range of the, the topics that have been discussed already in the conference uh, for land forces manoeuvring in the future battle space, uh, particularly looking at some of the offense defense uh, dynamics that are shifting around, as well as looking at the differences between perhaps the operational level and the tactical level uh, at which all of these different uh, phenomena will converge and have to be managed and commanded and potentially exploited as well. Um, we've got three excellent perspectives for you uh, in this panel today. We're going to start with my colleague, uh, Dr. Jack Watling, who's the Land Warfare Fellow at RUSI. Um, and uh, I, I can tell you he'll probably annoy you as much as uh, make you think, shall we say, um, but hopefully that will get us all going and get some questions coming in uh, as we proceed. Uh, we'll then move to Brigadier Charlie Hewitt, uh, who's the commanding officer of one artillery brigade uh, for the British Army. Uh, and then finally close out with last but definitely not least, Lieutenant General Richard Fumika, who's the former commanding general of US Army Space, Space and Missile Defense Command, uh, who also has a long career in uh, artillery and precision fires. Uh, so hopefully you're all by this point clear on the rules, um, but just to clarify, uh, presentations are on the record, Q&A, which I'll moderate, uh, will be off the record. Uh, we have an hour, so I won't take up any more of the time. Uh, Jack, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, so I'm going to kind of briefly set uh, the context and perhaps strategically some of the questions about when long range strike is likely to be employed in large scale ground operations. Um, the first thing I want to flag is that I think we, we sometimes fall into the trap of thinking that long range precision fires are a very escalatory capability, that they will be used in high intensity warfare, but probably not in competition or before that. And therefore we're quite comfortable with the idea that people can get into position during competition um, and not be facing this threat. I think we have to recognize that actually the way these capabilities are used because they are precise, and because they are limited in number and the number of munitions coming in can be tracked, they actually offer quite attractive escalation opportunities for adversaries. And so whether that is Iran responding to the Soleimani killing or whether it was you know, either the first day uh, or a couple of days of the war in Nagorno-Karabakh when key targets were struck with ballistic missiles and indeed the last day of that conflict when uh, Iskander M's were launched um, from Armenian territory towards um, Azeri forces in Shusha, in that instance, it was very clearly sending a message that we are going to use this higher level capability because if you don't start you know, negotiating and drawing things down now, this will cross a threshold and escalate. Um, and that poses a real challenge, I think, for us because it means that the economy of theater access that we have often uh, accepted or expected in the past is being constrained by the fact that the adversaries have long range precision fires that they may well employ very, very early on in a conflict to disrupt, to give us a bloody nose and to send messages. And so this is a threat that almost increases the price of activity. But then we get into the implications in actual war fighting if you move beyond the competition space and when formations are engaging against one another. And the first thing I would flag is that just conventional artillery, never mind you know, long range precision strike capabilities are extending their range comfortably out to you know, 50 to 70 kilometers. Um, and as a result, combined with the much higher fidelity and uh, expansive use of ISR assets in that kind of divisional deep uh, targeting brigade support areas, that kind of thing, we are likely to expect um, pretty accurate and responsive artillery fire from across enemy units, being able to strike logistics uh, and support elements of brigades as they maneuver, and particularly of the sinews connecting division to brigade. Um, and the result I suspect is that rather than having you know, a, a call down um, our logistics process whereby units at the front can demand what they need and it gets pulled forward, because maneuver of logistics and resupply is going to have to be a really deliberate and carefully planned process to get through that fires network, including the ability to suppress the sensors that are uh, kind of saturating that space, um, we're likely to see a lot of that logistical planning pulled back uh, and the distances that logistics units need to traverse extended and requiring a certain amount of force protection. And what that means, of course, is that they have to be massed somewhere and they have to mass into those elements to be able to maneuver with the appropriate protection, which brings us into the problem of long range precision strike, because um, those are targets that have to be able to coordinate with the units that they are supplying 
or resupplying and therefore and with higher echelons and headquarters and therefore are already in the game of over the horizon communications um, and they often have quite you know difficult to conceal emissions simply by virtue of the fact that you don't know where you're going to have to pick up uh, casualties from a medical situation for example so medical units will have a very substantial signature and that signature can be targeted um, as soon as we get beyond the the range of conventional artillery and we're talking about more precision effects in the kind of core deep i think there is a, a a key question that we have you know we can mitigate the effects of incoming fires to a certain extent with force protection engi engineering with um, effective discipline of our emissions um, and with the use of decoys and other capabilities to to provide a number of false targets but ultimately we are still going to have incoming and the enemy will only have a certain number of munitions they can employ that have those sorts of range bands. And so the challenge, I think, is to try and make targets uh, as low down their priority list as possible and remove targets of opportunity by using a ballistic missile defense uh, and air defense integrated to be able to increase the cost of going after any one target and thereby reducing the opportunities that an adversary has to uh, target, um, should we say, fleeting opportunities that might arise. But the second component is having to really proactively fight our own deep battle, because if we are struggling to resupply our units, if we are struggling to maintain the tempo of operations at the front, because we are having to fend off attacks on our deep and because our logistics units are being uh, attrited or broken up when they try and assemble to maneuver through that space. Um, we and we're not imposing those same challenges and constraints on our adversary, then their tempo of ground maneuver, their ability to employ uh, a higher volume of fires is likely to mean that our forward units will not be competitive. And so I don't think we can see this as just a, a defensive thing. You know, if you're not engaging in your own deep battle and you're not able to reach out, suppress, respond to those challenges, then you won't be competitive. And those two dynamics have to work in tandem. The other point I'd make is that when we are looking at environment where there are an increasing range of interception capabilities that have um, a fairly high probability of hit, to be honest, and, and um, defensive capabilities are improving, but very expensive and therefore vulnerable to saturation, um, you may not be able to stop targets coming in, so, but, but you will increase the or reduce the number of times they can conduct that kind of strike by making targets more defended and therefore requiring larger salvos to effectively engage them. The second requirement, therefore, if we accept that there are some instances where the adversary will simply see it as a high enough priority to commit the number of munitions necessary to strike those targets in the deep, is that you need the redundancy uh, and you need the resilience to be able to absorb those hits and um, essentially respond to them effectively. So for example, if your main logistics hub for your aviation brigade is, is struck, you need to be able to, for a short period, disperse operations uh, for those helicopters that weren't destroyed in the strike, but then reconstitute them as a new assembly area where there is still force protection engineering and all of the things that you would expect in place to be able to make sure that that brigade can continue to fight rather than having a single point of failure in our rear, which means that the adversary, when they strike those critical targets, uh, starts knocking down really substantial capabilities that we are going to rely and depend upon in order to be able to win the fight in the close. Um, the final point I would, I would make, I think, that we really have to get our heads around is that whereas in the past we've seen cores and divisions, uh, divisions fighting the next fight, cores fighting the fight after, uh, essentially shaping the, the conflict in days and weeks to come, increasingly it's the other way around, right? We are likely to expect to see higher echelons engaged in a fight with one another simultaneously with the combat brigades at the front line. And as a result, uh, you, can, you can lose at either end of the battlefield. Um, and both of those fights are necessary, which is why you need quite careful coordination between your maneuver elements and those long range strike assets. If you are able to disrupt an enemy higher echelon headquarters because you conduct a successful long range attack on it, then that will create a potentially quite short, but nonetheless significant window of opportunity where the adversary is not able to coordinate the density of sensors that they have been depending upon. And therefore that may open up opportunities for your ground maneuver units to start um, operating and seeking advantage through the maneuverist approach at the edge. That can only happen if you have a way of alerting them to what's been achieved, making them aware of the opportunities, 
and critically measuring the effect that you've delivered. Um, so I think I've, uh, I've exhausted my time, but I hope that I have um, sort of given a bit of context and the, the big picture that my, my fellow panelists can now dive into with their practitioners detail. So I'll hand back to the chair. Sorry, thank you, Jack. Um, without further ado, uh, I'll ask uh, Brigadier Hewitt to uh, continue the discussion. Great, thank you. Justin, can I just check that you can all hear me? I'm nervous with my communications. Yep, can hear you fine, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, I think, firstly, I would just say um, thank you very much for letting me speak, you know, a real honour. Um, I had some amusing jokes about how many recent papers I've read and the fact that I cited Jack's paper pretty extensively last year at the uh, US Army War College while I was there, but uh, I shall move on. Um, you'll forgive me for not using slides. Um, my focus today is really to kind of focus on um, being here to learn. Um, I have prepared some remarks, uh, but the bit I'm really looking forward to is the discussion, which I hope will follow in due course. Uh, and finally, by way of introduction, um, it would be remiss uh, not to talk about the integrated review uh, and the UK Defence Command Plan. Uh, you'll forgive me, of course, for not going into the detail in this forum, not least, of course, because uh, much is yet to be decided. So to try and address the questions posed and really um, brilliantly bounded by Jack's remarks, uh, my comments will be broken into two parts. Firstly, uh, the opportunities as I see them uh, presented by long range precision strike to ground commanders. And secondly, my priorities for protection. Given that I've only got 10 minutes, I'm going to focus very deliberately on the first part of the question, opportunities, uh, and that's where I'm most keen to have dialogue. So what then are the opportunities? I should note up front that uh, as the fires chief for three UK division, uh, this is the prism clearly through which I'm going to view the problem. Uh, and in short, I would list uh, the headline opportunities as Firstly, the land components contribution to the joint force fight. And I think that really speaks to Jack's point about um, the, I suppose, blurring of the geographical distinctions that we've grown up with. And specifically in the case of long range fires, how that can potentially unlock um, anti access and area denial environments, which I think is a huge opportunity. Secondly, the opportunity to conduct anti-air warfare, um, and I say anti-air warfare very deliberately as opposed to ground based air defense. Uh, the point being that it's about a change of mindset. Um, and an opportunity, sorry, actually, and a third, an opportunity to deliver the division's own suppression of enemy air defense, which in my case is about assuring the combat aviation brigade for deep strike, more of which in a bit. The fourth point I see is an opportunity to contribute uh, to the global response force. And I'm minded, particularly as uh, commander of the RT brigade, uh, by the UK MLRS firing this week on exercise spring storm in Estonia, working to a US observer through the ASCA framework, which is good and overdue. Um, fifthly, an opportunity to support all allies. And again, you know, in terms of working throughout that whole geographical framework. And then finally, I see an opportunity to discuss suppression and precision. Um, Jack was very precise with his words. Um, I think I would wish for an area effect and also an anti-armor effect. So I think there's a conversation about long range fires uh, as opposed to long range precision fires per se. So having recently come back from Texas, where we had the opportunity as 3UK Div uh, to take part in exercise Warfighter 21-4 in Texas, 3UK uh, Div was working under a, a US Corps, 3 Corps, alongside a US Armored Division, uh, 1AD, and alongside 3 French Division. So a US Corps with multinational divisions uh, had really brought my thinking into sharp focus, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak today. I think firstly, the realities of working as a division in a core uh, and noting also as a Brit, you'd expect me to say that core uh, might well be the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps or another NATO core uh, under a land command, uh, land component command. Now, history, to my mind, indicates that the land component may, and I highlight may, get 5% of the air allocation during the opening stages of a conflict uh, while the air war is prosecuted. Um, thus, in a land component construct comprises three cores, which my warfighter experience was, I was working on the assumption that three UK division may get allocated about 1.5% of the air allocation and that's as long as the division is on the core's main effort, which, of course, isn't guaranteed. Now, this is a fundamental mindset shift uh, for folk who've been in, used to the resource rich experience of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, where they think over the shoulder fires is the norm. And hence, I think land fires become central to the notion of the divisional deep fight and indeed the core deep fight. Uh, 
So what then of the div deep fight? Uh, we could get embroiled in a ranger's permissions and authorities discussion, which if I'm honest, I think confuses the conversation. Uh, so to my mind, the delineation is about areas where the division can affect and what it has to organically achieve that effect. So for me, it's about MLRS, long range rockets uh, and combat aviation. So my challenge as the divisional fires chief is to link sensor to shooter, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in questions, to have that effect, both lethal and non-lethal. And I think it's blending lethal and non-lethal effect, which is the really interesting bit from where I sit at the moment. Uh, and that's where I see real opportunity. Uh, I think that the divisional deep fight with surface to surface fires, uh, again, coming out of MLRS up to 80 kilometers, and further if we had ATACMs or TLAM allocated, uh, really facilitate the commanding general's intent, which through warfighter were firstly to destroy enemy air defense, and notice destroy, not suppress, to write down the enemy's long range shooters, and then to write down the, uh, the adversary's air and aviation. And again, I would state that this is about an anti-air warfare mindset as opposed to ground-based air defense. And critically for me in 3UK Div, I was seeking to enable the Combat Aviation Brigade to have their effect. And in Warfighter, the UK's Combat Aviation Brigade conducted strikes of up to 150 kilometers in depth, supported by layered suppression of enemy air defense, both lethal and non-lethal, mostly delivered by the air component. And therefore, shaping the divisional close fight, you know, ideally, as Jack said, an anticlimactic fight in terms of the div deep shaping the close. However, I'm not convinced that fighting is ever going to be anticlimactic for those doing it in the close. So I think my part in the plan, therefore, is to create the most favorable conditions I can at the point of contact. Accordingly, therefore, I think the deep fight is the divisional deep fight, sorry, correction, the deep fight is the divisional fight, uh, because as soon as the commanding general stops fighting the deep, then he or she is simply stacking up problems for tomorrow, which is rather Jack's point, I think. So the opportunity for ground commanders is, is to be aggressive and ruthlessly target what's on a high payoff target list, enemy air defense and enemy long range fires, which therefore is about intelligence, surveillance, target acquisition and reconnaissance. And note here, I've, I've highlighted target acquisition. I think we in the UK have advocated um, more ISR than ISTAR. What I would wish to see is more target acquisition to hunt in the deep. And in addition, there's something here in about uh, countering uh, anti-access and area denial in that long range surface to surface fires enable the ground commanders to have greater reach, thus options and flexibility. So at the operational or indeed the strategic level, the takes, this takes um, effect when including the threat, I think, of land precision fires or deep fires into the realm of impacting on the adversary's risk calculus, what they are not prepared and what they are prepared to risk in terms of high value capabilities and the associated political equity at home. Hence, I'm genuinely enthused about the notion of UK ground elements being forward deployed to be, as our American brothers and sisters would say, operationally and tactically unpredictable, uh, which again is a mindset change for us. Fundamental to this proposition is increased lethality in terms of unitary versus dual purpose improved conventional munitions in that, as I said previously, I see a role for an area and anti-armor effect, which a unitary warfare, warhead will not get after. Perhaps that's one to pick up in questions. And also, in terms of my part of the plan, maneuvering to fire, gun raids, if you will, uh, to punch launchers and guns forward, thereby maximizing the range of surface to surface fires. Um, and then there's the, the, the sort of counter argument, which Jack was touching on in terms of my increase of survivability. How do I keep my launchers and guns alive because I've got finite numbers? And that to me is about what I'm terming perpetual mo movement and motion. So it can't remain static, maximum dispersion to not present that target to the enemy and therefore not being hit. In terms of what that looks like, um, every moving every five to 10 minutes or contact UAV, uh, it's got to become the norm. And it's something that I'm working with the Royal School of Artillery at now. My point being that there are opportunities, it's my job to close with what the UK is seeking to do, uh, which is set out the integrated review, which is to privilege the deep, which I see as being very exciting. Now, in my last couple of minutes, just turning to the second part of the question, um, which is about uh, fragility and what's prioritised protection. Rather predictably as a gunner, uh, my answer uh, refers, I guess, to the system of systems. Um, thus, the focus in my head is to protect headquarters, the combat aviation brigade who can strike deep, and logistics. Now that's pretty revolutionary, I suppose, for a gunner, because I'm not talking about the platforms, I'm not talking about the pieces, and I'm working on the assumption I can't protect everything. And so my prioritization is admittedly pretty binary and by design. Uh, so I would wish to protect the shooters and thus create localized protective bubbles, which I can't do, but it chimes with the US thinking of multi-domain task forces, hence my point about survivability moves. Um, 
And in terms of, you know, how that then played forward, I would offer that, you know, three UK div is about war fighting. Uh, it's the most demanding requirement as I see it. And then we can then roll back or dial back to a less demanding operation if required. I would say the core and the divisional battle is a rocket artillery and air and attack aviation fight. The divisional deep fight is an aggressive fight and it's founded on ice star and counter battery. And there's a requirement to maneuver to fire both GMRS rockets and AS-90 cannon, which includes gun raids. My survivability moves, as I said, are founded on dispersal and perpetual motion. And I see the greatest threat to me being contact UAV and then incoming rockets. Therefore, you know, by way of summary, I think um, the opportunities I see are blending lethal and non-lethal effect, the notion of deep attack, primarily using attack aviation and where possible rocket artillery uh, to negate the adversary's advantage in terms of surface to surface range, which I can't get around. Uh, I see it being intelligence informed and see it with the ruthless disciplined execution of a high payoff target list and then the effects guidance matrix so that I'm prosecuting targets absolutely ruthlessly. Um, and then finally, of course, you know, closer interoperability with allies and partners, hence the point about UK MLRS firing in Estonia earlier this week. It's got to be about the lived experience, doctrine, understanding and familiarity, which is something I've got to close with. So I'm particularly clear eyed, I hope, in terms of my approach. I've not sought to get into the sort of tracks and wheels, 155, 120 or 105 millimeter debate, but I'm focused on the effect which I'm seeking to achieve and therefore how best to resource it. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion in due course. Um, and if I could close with the integrated review, which I genuinely see as an opportunity, uh, and I'm extremely keen to be involved in the Deep Recce Strike Brigade combat team discussion as it goes forward, but also that notion of global hubs, centers of excellence, uh, and where I would focus in terms of centers of excellence on targeting, integration, battle space management, UAS and counter UAS. I'm afraid that's my 10 minutes. I really look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brigadier. And uh, now if we move on straight on uh, to Lieutenant General uh, Formica uh, for the US perspective or a US perspective. Well, good morning. First, let me start with a communications check as well. Can you hear me? Hearing you fives. Okay, great, thanks. And so to the audience, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, I'd like to add my thanks to Rusi uh, and to the organizers for hosting this conference and providing a professional forum to explore the implications of long range precision strike assets on both the offense and the defense and over the course of the two days discussions at the strategic operational and tactical levels. I have high regard for the reputation of Rusi hosted conferences and am pleased to be able to participate in this one. So thanks to the organizers. And it was also great to uh, see my colleagues and friends, Lieutenant General Eric Wesley and Dr. Tom Carrico in the previous panel and to join uh, Dr. Jack Watling and Brigadier uh, Charlie uh, on this panel. Our panel was asked to engage in the discussion from the perspective of the impact of long range strike on forces maneuvering in the land domain. We were asked to look at it from the perspective of the offense. How do we employ strike capabilities to disrupt and to trip the adversary, and from the defensive perspective, how do we protect our most critical assets from adversary strike capabilities? I welcome this discussion as one of my principal topics for advocacy these past several years has been about offense and defense integration. Let me start with some background. I grew up in the Army, in the United States Army, as a career field artillery officer and fire supporter. My last assignment, however, took a turn as I was assigned as the commanding general of the United States Army Space and Missile Defense Command. So I spent the majority of my time in service focused on the offense at the core level and below, but culminated my career on the defensive side of fires. Offense defense integration isn't particularly new or innovative. It's inherent in coalition joint and combined arms operations. It will remain a central feature in multi-domain operations. And you've heard it in the comments from the two, my two previous uh, colleagues on this panel. But let's spend a few minutes as I see it, uh, exploring how it applies to fires. So first I started talking about offense defense integration as a component of air and missile defense shortly after I took command of the Army's Space and Missile Defense Command. I wasn't in the job very long before I became acutely aware of the lack of missile defense capacity. 
we'll never have enough air and missile defense assets to defeat to defend all of our critical assets. Thinking about that caused me to draw on my experience as a field artilleryman and fire supporter during the Cold War. We knew then that we would never win a solely defensive oriented counterfire fight. They simply had way too many artillery systems and could outrange ours. No matter how good, how responsive, how well trained, or how effective our counterfire systems were, there simply wouldn't be enough. So consistent with air land battle doctrine at the time, we developed tactics, techniques, and procedures to execute what we refer to as proactive counterfire. To execute, excuse me, that's to take out or mitigate artillery systems before they could shoot at our formations and to continually attack them throughout the fight. So how did we do that? Well, there were essentially four elements to the counterfire approach. One, rapid offensive maneuver. If he was being pushed back and out of range, he wouldn't be shooting at us. Two, take out his eyes. Deny his recon and surveillance capability. Three, deep attack using joint fixed wing, U.S. Army rotary wing, and deep fires like tomahawks or attackings to take out or disable high payoff targets, long range weapon systems, command and control nodes, logistics bases, and other capabilities which supported his artillery formations. This also included his air defense assets so that we could open corridors for our air delivered fires. And then finally, we got to good old fashioned defensive counter battery fire. What most people think of when we say counter fire to defeat the adversary's long range and precision strike. So when I began to appreciate the air and missile defense challenge of being outnumbered, I saw the need for a similar approach where we employed both offensive and defensive capabilities. And that gets to the heart of the question. So for the past 20 years, US and NATO capabilities have been focused on counterinsurgency operations and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Many of the organizations and capabilities required to conduct offense and defensive integration of fires for large scale ground combat operations have been significantly reduced or eliminated from our army force structure. Much of our training experience had atrophied and our modernization efforts had been minimized. As we now begin to rethink about the threats that we potentially face, you heard talked about in the first panel, reconsider our ability to conduct large scale ground combat operations, but to operate in a multi-domain environment, these capabilities, these fires capabilities and our ability to employ them have become vitally important again. So with that as context, I'd like to use the remaining time to share some thoughts on this topic using three aspects of .mil PF as a framework, doctrine, organization and materiel. First doctrine. Doctrine defines how we'll conduct our operations and employ our capabilities. Our future operational construct revolves around the conduct of multi-domain operations in periods of competition, crisis, and conflict. We will conduct offense and defense integration of both lethal and non-lethal fires and effects in and through all five domains, from the land to the sea to air, and in space and cyberspace. As we conduct multi-domain operations, we can draw upon our fire's doctrine and lessons we've learned from our previous experience. Just as we fought proactive counterfire during the Cold War, our offensive fire's doctrine today still places a premium on attacking and attriting our adversary's long-range strike and missile assets, as well as his air defense capabilities. This will enable and protect freedom of maneuver and mitigate his A2, A2, A2 AD advantage. These become high payoff targets for us to attack. And we conduct attack operations in concert with active and passive defense so that our air defense assets can be most effectively employed to defend those critical assets. Second, organization. 
How we organize, organize our formations also contributes to the integration of offense and defense. In the U.S. military command structure, U.S. Strategic Command is uniquely organized with both global strike assets and missile defense to provide for offense defense integration at the operational level. At the component command, we're organized with both battlefield coordination detachments and the Army Air and Missile Defense Commands. Each have a distinct role, the BCD, to coordinate the employment of offensive fires combined and joint ground, air, and naval fires, while the Air and Missile Defense Command to provide integrated air and missile defense to the theater, both operating out of the theater uh, air operations center and in close concert with one another. The U.S. Army's multi-domain task force will bring a mix of long, mid, and short-range offensive fires and defensive air defense artillery assets into one command, complemented with intelligence, cyber, electronic warfare, and space capabilities. And the introduction of theater's fires, theater fires commands will provide a command and control headquarters focused on providing long and mid-range strike capabilities needed in an A2AD environment and to reduce the strike and missile threat against our formations. It will be necessary that these commands work closely with the Air Operations Center to complement, not compete with, joint air delivered fires and with the Air and Missile Defense Command to optimize the conduct of attack operations. At the tactical level, the Army is reconstituting both field artillery and short range air defense battalions and will bring back the division artillery headquarters to provide fire support that a division requires. As we look a bit further out, however, once we've regained our footing, recalibrated our ability to provide offense and defense fires and to defend our tactical formations, um, I will offer that we might want to relook our brigade level headquarters to achieve offense and defense integration. For me, it's not a stretch to envision the formation of multifunctional fires brigades that would essentially bring many of these same capabilities together. Finally, materiel. Long range precision fires and air and missile defense are two of the six modernization priorities that have been established by the US Army. Our modernization efforts are making great strides to improve our capability for both offensive and defensive fires. Extended range cannon artillery, precision strike missile, ground delivered mid range capabilities such as Tomahawk and SM6 and improved munitions on the offensive side. Short range air defense, indirect fire protection capability, lower tier radar, and the IBCS, the Integrated Air and Missile Defense Battle Command System, which offers potential for integrated offensive and defensive fire control and linkage with joint all domain command and control. As we look ahead to what's next, can we envision a material solution that might further advance offense and defense fires? Dr. Tom Carrico, who you heard on the first panel in his thoughtful paper on distributed defense calls for the development of offense defense launchers, any launcher, any mission. I like to say that we're just one technology away from having a launcher that is capable of firing both offensive fires and defensive interceptors, either by interchanging pods on the same launcher and adjusting the fire control solution, or even having multiple multifunctional pods that contain both capabilities. We do this today with the vertical launch system, VLS, on the Aegis ship, which launches both Tomahawk missiles and SM-3 ballistic missile interceptors. Why not on our ground launchers? So the technology is already approaching, and I would suggest is something that must be considered in the development of the next generation of ground indirect fires and missile defense systems. This will require command and control uh, systems to implement and has implications for tactical fire control. All driving further changes in doctrine, organization, training, manning, and leader development. Other developing material solutions that will, re that will contribute to the defense, excuse me, to the offense and defense integration are hypersonics, directed energy, and other non-lethal capabilities. Just last week, Lieutenant General Dan Carbler the current commanding general of the Army Space and Missile Defense Command referred to hypersonic weapons as the ultimate 
offense defense capability. So what's my message? To preserve friendly freedom, freedom of maneuver, to reduce long range strike capabilities, to open corridors in an A2 AD environment, and to defend our critical assets, we must employ integrated offensive and defensive fires. That to achieve this offense and defense integration, we must consider our doctrine, our organizations, and our material development. Now, I always like to close when I sit on a panel by drawing attention to the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, and civilians from not only the United States forces, but all of our coalition partners and allies that develop, deploy, operate, and would have to fight these systems. They are our most critical asset. So with that, I thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank mm-hmm. you.